Oh, good morning, Westside. It is so good. I always would say the live streams are so good to be with you, but let me just say it's really, really good to see you today. Uh, if you're new, yeah. And if you're on live stream, I want you to know we're in an air-conditioned room, uh, and feel free uh, to come. We would love to have you. Uh, if you're new, uh, here's what I know when I'm new. If it's at a, a, a guest's house, you know, a party or whatever, I'm super insecure. I'm awkward. Uh, I think I'm the only person in the room who doesn't know where the washrooms are. You know, and you're kind of doing one of these, just trying to find things out. Uh, look, a lot of us are really new right now, and you are not in the minority by any means. And so just a, a real, real special welcome to you. I don't want you to feel insecure as you learn about Westside. Like, you might be asking questions like, what is it that they just muttered after they read the, the text of Scripture? By the way, it's thanks be to God. Uh, we, just, we just want to invite you to uh, be able to find out everything that you need to know about the church. And so we ask you to text new, and that'd be great. But some of you might want to have a conversation. Uh, maybe there's conversations about the church, uh, maybe about faith, or maybe just through COVID, and you just want to talk to somebody about life, uh, trying to navigate some things, and you're not sure how to do that. Uh, Email me, uh, cliff at wchurch.ca, and I will make sure that the right person will talk to you and you'll be able to have the conversation that you need. We're just really, really glad that you're here, regardless if you're brand new, a longtime West Sider, or somewhere in between. So as you look at me, right away you're able to discern Cliff is not a young man. That was not a joke. Uh, you're able to go, yeah, he's, he's bald, you know, he's got the dad bod. I've almost got something that I've, uh, uh, coining a phrase, the, the granddad bod. Not, not that, you know, my kid, like, I'm still some years away, but like, and, and one of the things that I do is I uh, just have these moments, uh, I just look back on my life and I, I just consider, uh, I, I just think about the different decisions I've made, the different memories I've, I've had. And some of them are really good and I'm really thankful for, but some of them are difficult. And some of them, uh, I, I look and I'm like, I made mistakes. And those mistakes caused damage to people that I love. And as I look at the damage that I caused through my mistakes, there's a new emotion. It's, it's regret. It's guilt. There's this weight and I'm just like, oh, if I only knew then what I know now. And, and there's this just, I, I wish I could do, have a do-over. Maybe some of you are like that, it, whether regards of your station in life, that you look uh, at some of your past and you're like, that, there's this regret. How, how do I reconcile the, the guilt that I feel from my past with my present because if I can't reconcile that, my present's terrible and my future looks fairly bleak. And Jesus' people struggle with this as well. And then there's verses like Romans 8, 28, which simply says, all things work to the good for them that love God and are called according to his purpose. And that verse is kind of like a promise, all things will work to, for the good. But there's a caveat for Jesus' people. And I don't know about you, but for me, as I look at that regret and, and I look at the guilt and I'm trying to reconcile that, the, the pain of my past with my present and my future trajectory, I have to lay on top of that Romans 8.28. Because of who I am in Jesus, there's a promise that God is making to me as one of his people that he, not me, he is going to work things for the good. That's God's promise to me. I don't know how. Like, it doesn't undo anything, but there is something redemptive that the Lord will do with our past that will inform our present and our future. And for me, I'm like, oh, that feels good. And for me, as I look at the past and, and some of my mistakes, which have caused pain and hurt for the people that I love, and the regret that I feel, one by one, God surprisingly, in ways that I could never imagined, has found ways to redeem that, 
to repurpose my painful past with a redeemed future. That's something God did. That's a promise that God makes for Jesus' people. Like so often you may have heard me say that when we as people uh, come to faith in Christ, uh, that there's healing, there's repair, there's restoration. And yes, there is something spiritually, absolutely, that's first and foremost. But as that spiritual renewal happens, there's other things that happen. And this is one of the examples that I'm talking about, that God will find a way to repurpose and redeem our painful past to allow us to have a redeemed future. That's so beautiful. I say that because today's text, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through to 10, you have the Apostle Paul, who is a man who has, it's an understatement to say he's made mistakes. This is a man who is at the very least complicit with murdering innocent people. This is a man who is so tyrannical that innocent men, women, and children would run for their lives. This was not a good man before he met Jesus. There's also a man who has experienced this work that the Lord does, that, he's, that God will work all things to the good for those that love God and are called according to his purposes. And we see this conversation that the Apostle Paul has as a mentor to his protege, Timothy, the leader of the church in Ephesus in the first century. And a lot of what we've been talking about in the past is, is, is uh, something for the church. But here, this is just an intimate conversation, if you will, where Paul talks to Timothy in light of his mistakes, but also very aware of God's ability to repurpose and redeem past for the present and for the future. And so what is it that God wants to speak to Timothy through the Apostle Paul? What is it that God wants to speak to Westside through this text? And there's three things that we see. Uh, the first thing that we see is, is to be formed. The second thing is to be eternal. And the third thing is to be hopeful. Be formed, be eternal, and be hopeful. So let's look at be formed in verse six. So this is Paul talking to Timothy. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. So right away, what we see in being formed is that there is a call for church leadership to be faithful. When the Apostle Paul says, you, Timothy, need to put these things before the brothers, what are the, these things? And if you've been tracking with us in our series, uh, two weeks ago, Pastor Matt unpacked 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 16, where it was how Christians should act in the household of God, in the household of faith. And wh why is this for, for Timothy, the reason why this is going to be hard is because they're not acting like they're supposed to be. They're not acting like Jesus' people. And God is calling Timothy to say, I, I need you to speak what's true. I, I need you, like, uh, it might be very easy for you to uh, say something easy something palatable in, in a difficult time for the church in Ephesus, but you don't get to decide that you're called to be faithful. And to be faithful is to actually preach the whole counsel of God, the entire scripture. That's what Timothy is being called to. This is what church leadership is called to. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, uh, Jesus uh, died on the cross, rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven, and the, the Holy Spirit just fell, Acts chapter two. What's happening here, yes, the Holy Spirit is falling, but the, the New Testament church is being born. The church as we know it has been born uh, in light of the, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus and the empowering of the Holy Spirit in a new way. And so what is it that the church is known for? And they, the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, 
to the breaking of bread and to prayer. This is what Timothy and every other church leadership is bound to, to be faithful, to be marked by the teaching of the Bible, to be marked by partnership and community, to be marked by communion and prayer. And how difficult for Timothy to be able to go, wait, so I can't just say whatever I want. But I, so I can't say whatever, you know, uh, the, the, the church is wanting me to necessarily talk on. I can't pick the topics. They can't pick the topics. The answer is no. This is the call for Timothy. Put these things before the brothers. This is hard. And then uh, last week, we looked at the beginning of chapter four, verses uh, starting in verse one through to five, and it got harder. Can you imagine Timothy going up to the church uh, congregation and saying, and some of you are availing yourselves to false teachers. I know you love them. I know they're, they were at one point super influential in your lives, but stop remembering them as they were and see them as they are now. False teachers, they're agents of Satan. And if you keep availing yourself to these false teachers, it's gonna be detrimental to you as an individual. <laughs> Can you imagine Timothy dropping that bomb? And everyone's like, what? Like, he might have like, ooh. Like, this is hard, this is hard stuff. This is the call for Timothy, bring these things before the brothers. The call is for Timothy and for every other church leadership is to be faithful. Be faithful to the text of scripture. Allow the church to be formed by the Bible. This is what ordinary church is all about. And the next thing that we see here, if we just keep reading in this text, uh, to put these things before the brothers. Now, some of you might be bothered by the gender exclusivity of that word, brothers. Like, where, where's, where are the women? And fair, that, that is a fair observation. And I, I just need you to know that the Bible that, that was written originally in Koine Greek, uh, the Greek word there is actually better defined brothers and sisters. It's actually a gender inclusive word. So a better way for us to read this is for Timothy to be faithful to put these things before the brothers and the sisters. To bring these things to the whole church. And what gets really tough there is now that the church is being held accountable as individuals and as a body to be held accountable to scripture as well. That not only is church leadership to be faithful uh, and by that by being formed by the text of scripture, so is the church, every individual person. And friends, that gets really, really hard. Like when, when the Bible is instructing me in my marriage, for example, uh, and, and I might want to love Aaron, my wife, the way I want to love her. And, and scripture says in Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives the way Christ loved the church. I'm like, rats. I don't want to love Aaron the way Jesus loved Aaron. I want to love Aaron the way I want to love Aaron. Sometimes the text of scripture is hard for us as Jesus' people to allow ourselves to go, I'm gonna be formed by what the text is saying. It's, it, it can get difficult, but that is exactly what the call is for you and I. But the challenge for us is this, in, in today's day and age especially, you and I are masters of being able to um, self-diagnose and self-prescribe. Like we have more information in the internet, in our pocket, readily available to get all the data that we want. You got a symptom, WebMD, check it out. That's exactly what it is, like we know better. Let me give you a ridiculous example. Uh, the, it's ridiculous because of how I acted. So, uh, one, uh, so there was a time where I was a full-time painter, a commercial painter, and on the job, I cut my thumb really, really bad. And I'm like, oh, I'm starting to feel faint. I think I better go to the doctor. And so I go to emergency, and I kind of put my hand on the table, and the doctor says, 
yeah, you're going to need stitches. I'm like, all right, all right. I've been here before. And, and so I said, how do you do that? Are you going to put the syringe into my wound to actually freeze it for the stitching? He goes, yeah, that's what we do. So I self-diagnosed, and I now self-prescribed. And I said, yeah, you're not going to do that. And the doctor's like, say what? I said, yeah, you're not going to do that. See, I actually have a massive issue with all of that because of childhood operations. Like, I, to say I'm skittish is an understatement. And I'm like, yeah, no, you're not going to do that. He goes, Cliff, if, if we don't actually stitch this up, the wound is going to be very painful and take much longer to heal. You're not going to be able to paint. I'm like, yeah, I don't care. Almost defiant in my self-prescription. I know better. Just put a bandit on it. And he goes, there's going to be a really terrible scar. I'm like, so? Who cares? A silly example. But you and I, our culture, in part because of the information age, in part because of our own hubris, we have a propensity to self-diagnose and self-prescribe all the time. We do it on everything. The call of Scripture is very different for Jesus' people. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 to 8, it says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And do you see the tension there in, in this part of this verse? The tension is trust in the Lord. But it's like lean not on your own understanding. Why? Because we like to lean on our own understanding way more than we trust in the Lord. That feels good. Self-prescription, self-diagnosis. That's, that's, I want to just trust me. And here's this tension. No, it's actually about trust. Trust in the Lord. In verse 9 of Proverbs chapter 3 is the call. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. In all your ways acknowledge him is to simply go, I'm going to acknowledge that the Lord's ways are higher than my ways. I'm going to acknowledge that I don't know what I don't know and he knows absolutely everything. It's not like acknowledge, like, you know, kind of, hey, Lord. Like, that's not what acknowledging the Lord is about. Acknowledging the Lord is day to day, I am acknowledging his lordship and my humanity. And then there is the outcome, and he will make your paths straight. So just here in Proverbs chapter 3, the call is this. And, and I know Proverbs are truisms. But if, if you can trust in the Lord, acknowledge him like his lordship, he will make your paths straight. And you and I go, oh, that, that sounds really good. So the question, the call for us is, can we trust in the Lord? Like, do you and I believe that God is good? Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, the entire library of Scripture, God shows time and time again, one, his trustworthiness, two, his goodness, and three, that his ways are very different than our ways. And then go back to his trustworthiness and his goodness. Like, it's just a cycle. It just keeps coming. So many narratives in Scripture are reminders for you and I to go, right, God is good. Why do we need to be reminded? Because we forget. We totally forget all the time. I could have the best time, and then all of a sudden, uh, well, may or may not be a true story. I get a little cranky with the heat. I hate my life. You know, I, I go from, you know, a wonderful moment to just, I hate everything. You, you know, and like, I just, I forget, I forget, I forget. Christian, so do you. Here's a really simple but great example. Joshua chapter 2. And God is saying to his people, we're going to occupy the land that I've promised you. And in order for that to happen, Jericho is a city that needs to fall so that we can occupy the promised land. And if you look in Joshua chapter 2, uh, as all this was happening, Joshua and a few others meet Rahab, the prostitute. A, an, an outsider, someone who's unclean, someone who doesn't fit the club. 
And here we're beginning to see uh, an example of Rahab trusting in the Lord, discovering his goodness, discovering his heart, discovering she doesn't deserve anything and that doesn't matter because God's heart is so loving towards her. And, and, and so Rahab takes this risk in trusting there is a risk, there is this step of faith and so she actually uh, aligns herself with Jesus' people. And the city falls. And, and there's just little references continuing on in Joshua where you begin to see that Rahab began to uh, understand that she was becoming a new creation. That she's being spiritually reborn. And her identity was completely rewritten. And that step of trust, there was nothing logical about it. If she were to trust uh, in her own understanding, she wouldn't have done the things that she did. But because she trusted and availed herself to the things of the Lord, she began to experience something that only the Lord could make, could only make possible. And I love in Matthew chapter 1, where Matthew uh, just talks about Jesus's family tree, who do you see? You see Rahab, the, the prostitute, who's not the prostitute anymore. It's Rahab, someone in the bloodline of our great high priest, Jesus. The call for us is to trust. If we're actually gonna allow ourselves as church leaders and as Jesus's people to be formed by scripture, we have to recognize we don't know what we don't know, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to trust. I'm just going to trust. And as you do, you're going to discover what straight paths actually look like because God's actually coming in and stepping in. There's something supernatural that happens. That is the call because scripture after scripture throughout all of Bible will point to this example played out time and time again. Christians, just allow yourselves to be reminded of the trustworthiness of God, the heart of God, and the way for us to actually trust God, to know God, to know ourselves is to be formed through the text of Scripture. Yes, there are some hardships and challenges for us in doing that, but that is the call. Let's keep going. Verse 7 and 8 we see that the call for Jesus' people is to be eternal. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So like verse seven almost reads like that Proverbs three text that we just looked at. Like there have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths, which is actually what Paul talked about already in chapter one of one Timothy. Why is he saying that? Because Jesus's people are being infatuated by this new information, which Paul really calls out as irreverent, silly, and they're myths. Rather, Train yourself for godliness. So, Westside, I, I don't know. Like, when, when you read those few words, train yourself for godliness, what, what comes to your mind? Like, if I could somehow survey you, uh, you would say, well, it's, it's reading the Bible. Check, Agreed. Some of you might go, no, 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 it's, we got to go deeper. It's, it's studying the Bible. I'm like, oh, check, check. Really agree with that one. Prayer, mm-hmm, check, check, check. And it doesn't go much further than that, my experience. We, we struggle to go, I'm just having a hard time just reading the Bible. That's, that's why we have devotionals, because it somehow makes it a little bit easier for us to know, what am I reading? I, I don't know. And like, no, that's why we need to study the Bible. We need to memorize the Bible. And if you're really spiritual, you'll journal. And I don't mean putting social media posts on whatever 
your opinions are. I mean, journal, just you and the Lord. But I want to suggest something. What if that is a, a good start, but it's incomplete? Like, what if training for godliness was actually more than that? Like, it was encounters with God. Like, to experience God. What if it was transformation, to be different? Because I think you and I have, especially in the North American context, my experience um, is that we understand training for godliness as the uh, absorbing and the consuming of information. And then the doing, praying, going to church or whatever. And again, those are great. But what if there was front and center the idea of having experiences with God? Because, like, for me, I can, and I do, not very well sometimes, I can have text exchanges with my wife. And I can read what she's telling me. I'm, I'm under, the data is coming into my head, or I can be with her. I can experience her. Much more intimate. It's, it's, it's much more life-giving for me to have a face-to-face -face relationship with my wife than just texts. And I think sometimes when we just only Bible, 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 we're reading about God. And again, I'm not saying to take that off the table. I'm just saying add a piece to it. It's both and. I want to read about God, but I, I want to experience God. I want to experience him. I want to experience being with him. I want to experience his presence. I want to be changed because of my experiences with him. But here's the, here's the difficult part. The word train yourself for godliness you know, the, the, in the Greek words where we get the word gym. So think, think for those of you that work out and those that don't but probably should and want to and aren't, whatever it is, um, you, you've got a really good picture here of training. And this is my simple definition, that training is through resistance and repetition. Like through resistance and repetition, that's training. Like I've talked to you a little bit before, like I, I've been going biking. That, that's kind of a thing that I've been doing. And one of the places I like to bike is Stanley Park. And there's rules, I don't know if you know this, in biking in Stanley Park. Like the tourists with the Shaw rent-a-bikes, you're on the, the seawall. You, you, this is your pattern, you know, like on the trail. You don't go straight, you, you just go sideways. You're, you're kind of shaky with the wheel. And the laughers, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And then those that are hardcore, you're on the road where the cars are. And so I am in total denial, classic male. I'm like, I'm that hardcore guy. I haven't biked for 15 years, but that's me. And I'm, if you've ever been to Stanley Park, I, there's a really long hill. Like, I think it's like 40 miles long. And I'm biking, little eight-year-olds are passing me five times the speed of sound and sweat's dripping. I get to the, the top and I'm overlooking um, the, the bridge, Lionsgate Bridge. And I did what every other North American does, I posted a selfie. Look at me, what I accomplished. First time ever. And I realized I still had a bunch more to go. I just didn't know. And I'm like, I'm ready to vomit. I hate my life, I hate the city, I hate the gene pool I swam out of, I hate everything. But through resistance and repetition, I just kept going at it. Not that day, I just did one lap and I was ready to die. But resistance going up that hill made me stronger. At the peak, I'm doing six, seven laps in one day Round and round and round. How did, I, how did I get there? Resistance and repetition. 
Resistance made me stronger. Repetition made me more prolific, more able to do this. This is what it is to train for godliness. Like for you and I to be able to go, I want to experience and encounter God. Okay. Resistance and repetition. You might be walking down the road and all of a sudden you feel the Lord saying, hey, son, hey, daughter, how about this? I'd like you to do this. Uh Uh-uh. That's the first. And the next one, give me a sign. Let me hear a dog bark. And then I'll know it's you, Lord. But to actually have encounters with the Lord and transformation, it's going to take some resistance, like working through our own insecurities. It's going, to, it's going to take repetition to keep doing this over and over again. So as I was meditating on training yourself up for godliness, I'm like, what, where's Westside at with that? And so uh, I just threw out an email uh, to the staff, and I said, hey, I have a question for our church. What are God's stories that are no more than a month old? Like, are our people actually having encounters, experiences with the presence of God? Are, because of that, are they changing as people that would embody maybe what a a, a follower of Jesus should look like because we're supposed to know how to act, especially in the household of faith? Like, are we doing that? How, How are we doing? And there was a really, really cool email exchange of hearing about you and your experiences, your encounters with God, and your transformation. And what I'd like to do is to take a few minutes and let you hear about you. So one of the things that I kept hearing over and over again, a bunch of you, all y'all are a bunch of evangelists. That you're just telling people about Jesus. There's so many stories of, of conversion, and I've, I've distilled this to about four examples. There, there were many, and so just, just know that. Uh, here's one. Uh, again, there was tons of stories of, of amazing conversions. An attendee from Alpha in spring 2020 came to Christ and began to follow Jesus. But that doesn't fit one month, right? So he was baptized that summer and went into a discipleship group with a few community members from my CG. And he was filled with a passion for evangelism and came back to serve as an Alpha leader in spring 2021. There's the one month. In his group, two people have been saved by Christ, repenting of sin, confessing belief in Jesus as the Son of God, and asking Jesus into their heart. One of them was his friend who actually invited him to come to Westside in the first place, even though they weren't even a a, a full disciple of Jesus. Jesus used her to save him and then used him to lead her to Christ. There's some really cool examples of people having experiences where God might just show up in a surprising way. It wasn't planned. Like, uh, I think three weeks ago, Pastor Matt's preaching, and uh, one person got the gift of tongues. And if you're like, what's that? More to come on that in the fall. Um, But, so the Holy Spirit just showed up and gave this woman the gift of tongues. No one was asking for that. Pastor Matt wasn't, like, prompting this, but God in his goodness, and this woman was just like, she must have been super open, and boom. That same gathering, someone else got healed. Boom. This is training for godliness to go, yes, I fully believe that these experiences, encounters with God are amazing. I want you, as you're hearing these, to go, I want that. I want that. Let me give you more. Here's one of transformation. Listen to how their heart changed. A Westsider prayed and received for an inexplicable gift of mercy. Their heart has softened so unexpectedly, and their disposition has changed dramatically. That is so beautiful. Can you just... Like if we had people walking around with this heart of mercy towards the church and to the city, 
I, I love that this person took a risk and, and, and prayed for the gift of mercy. Like even the emotional awareness to go, why are they praying for that? Because I don't think I'm merciful enough. That humility in that prayer is beautiful. Here's another one. A member of the intercessory prayer team received the interpretation of tongues in a prayer session. So there's another one. Uh, and another West Sider prayed for words of knowledge and wisdom. One of the things that we've seen a lot is so many examples of God giving words of prophecy, words of knowledge that were then shared to, to the body. Like one, one person emailed me, too many to the count. That was Pastor Matt. Too many to count. <laughs> he loves them. It's too many to count. It's amazing. This is you, church. These are your encounters with God. And this is how God shows up in surprising and amazing ways. Uh, the, the, the fruit of the spirit stuff like kindness. I, I saw so many uh, emails of people visiting shut-ins. They're just not able to get out and you quietly are just visiting these people and loving these people. And the social media world is none the wiser, but the Lord sees it. And it's beautiful. There's examples of serving the needy, like practically addressing the needs of those that are in need. Not just visiting shut-ins that are lonely, but actually addressing their needs. This is you. This is transformation. I know sometimes Christians get a bad rap going, they're very judgmental, and sometimes we can be. They're really cold-hearted, and, and sometimes we can be. But if we allow ourselves to just let these encounters with the Lord transform us. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, begins to bubble up naturally. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. These are the things that just naturally are, are a byproduct of lives lived with the Lord. Okay, I got more. And I'm really running out of time. Yikes. Uh, okay, uh, this is a real cool one. Um, there, this is one of experiences and, tra and uh, transformation. And uh, heads up, in, in about, depending on how much longer I go, in a little while, I'll just say that, uh, we're going to watch the baptisms that we had last week. Last week we went and actually did the actual baptisms. Today you get to celebrate what Jesus is doing. And so this story is from last week, last Sunday. So that really fits that one month. The, the baptisms this past Sunday, three extra people following the call to repent and be baptized. So we had, I don't know, I forget, like seven or eight people. And in that time, you know, we're all getting ready. The Lord just moved on three people going, I need to be baptized. Beautiful. Yes. I love when the Spirit just shows up unannounced in surprising, wonderful ways. And that's what these encounters with, and these, these moments with the Lord are supposed to look like. They're, they're supposed to be normalized. So uh, they go on. Uh, one of them was thinking he was saved, but through a short conversation, being open to the realization that he had no hope in his version of salvation. After hearing the true gospel, that is by Jesus we are saved, and belief in him and his works for us, he confessed and got baptized. How surprising, how wonderful. But this comes through training, through resistance and repetition. If you want this, some of these stories, and they, they're not resident yet, it is a, actually a call for us to actually pursue these things. But just know that there's going to be some awkwardness. Remember once I'm on the park bench in Stanley Park and I just felt prompted to talk to this person beside me. Like, oh man, like what if I look like a dork? This is the resistance. What, what, if, what if they get mad at me? Mm-hmm, yeah. Those are the things that you're gonna have to work through. What, what if that wasn't the Lord? What if that was just, you know, something else? Mm-hmm, I get that. But that's the call. That's the training. That's the resistance. And then after that, the repetition, do it again and again 
and again. See what the Lord does. See how you have these amazing experiences. Okay, I need to move on. Verse 10, be hopeful. For to this end, we toil and strive because we have our hopes set on the living God who is the savior of all people, especially those who believe. You know, Simon Sinek is an, is a, is a, is an author who um, really asks you and I to define our why. Like, why do you do what you do? And maybe you've watched some people do things for the Lord, and you're like, that just seems nutty. Who in their right mind would do that? And people that do things for the Lord that aren't comfortable, that require training, are people with a very clear, defined why. And this text, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, is a Christian's why. Because we have our hope set on the living God. That's why. My simple definition of hope is the anticipation of good based on the nature of God. That's my simple definition. So why do I toil? Why do I strive? Why do you toil and strive? Because I expect good because of the nature of God. Why? Well, he's the savior of all people, especially of those who believe. God has made salvation available for everyone. John 3, 16, God so loved the world. It's just like with Adam and Eve, like God made him and that was great, but there was sin and there needed to be forgiveness. Like God loved Adam and Eve and showed grace. We looked at that last week, but there was more. And this is it, like, and, and so God, who is the savior of all people, salvation is available to everyone, absolutely everyone, regardless of your regrets, what we talked about earlier, regardless of your guilt, regardless of all of that. And then those who actually believe, we experience something special. God shows his goodness to all. We talked about that before, it's called common grace, but especially to those who believe. It's like Romans 8, 28, all things work to the good for those that love God, called according to his purpose. The promise and the caveat, that's what this end part, especially to those who believe. So Christians, I would love for you and I to be a people that allow ourselves to have our hope fixed on the living God. Our expectations are based on the living God. That's why with our training for godliness, that we would sit there and go, I actually want to do more than just read and study, but actually I want to experience. I want to experience the presence of God. I, 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 I want to actually be transformed. I don't want to be the same person. I, I, I want to be different. This is the hope that we have. Why? Because God is living. He's living. So we're about to move into just uh, this baptism video. And as we see this video, and after that, we're gonna respond with worship and communion. I want you to just allow yourselves to go right. I can be hopeful because of the living God who is the savior of all people, especially as we see with these baptisms, those who believe. Because God's heart for us is good. The call for us is to trust him and he will make our paths straight, whether we're church leaders or whether we're just the average person in the church body. The call is for all of us. Lord, I thank you that we can just sit in this text, Lord, that we're allowing ourselves to be spiritually impacted. And I pray for those that have the courage to have a prayer of I wanna experience you, I want to be transformed by you. Uh, Lord, would you just show up in wonderful and surprising ways? Uh, Even in the rest of our few moments together or if it's at home, wherever it is, we trust you. And we trust that when you show up, it's going to be fantastic. 
So Lord, I just pray that you would show up in our individual lives. Lord, we pray that you would show up in this church in a new way. That Lord, that you would show up in our city in a new way. Praise in Jesus' good name. Amen. Here's the video.